Okay. Yeah, you don't have any balls. You see with it. Okay, guys, let's let's get started. We get blind time over here to hunt. Experience blind time. He recognizes. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Welcome to everybody. Uh, we we appreciate your flexibility. We normally meet on the third Monday, but there was something happening last Monday. What was it again? Oh yeah. The Astros were playing the Red Sox last uh, Monday. So uh, we would, thanks for being flexible and being with us. Um, let me start with a little bit of a sad note. Uh, as, as many of you know, one of our long-term members passed away two, two weeks ago, Joe Russell. Joe was age 90. She was very, very active in baseball in the Houston area. She uh, was married to the general manager and president of the Houston Buffs, uh, oh, the minor league team when they were here. She's also very active in the baseball association, baseball dinner that was the most successful baseball dinner in, in the country. She had over a thousand people attend the meeting. And uh, they put, the Astros participated, but Joe and her group was one that put it on. It was first class, and Joe was very loyal and here all the time, as long as she was able. And then when she had some problems, Mike Mikoski was kind enough to bring her over here to me. And she was very active until she uh, uh, got a little sicker. And uh, her basic comment was every time she was here that, hey, guys, you know, Larry Durker should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> She made that comment over and over again. Very small Mary sometimes, but, uh, but uh, we're, we're going to miss we're going to miss Joe and a number of the people here did attend her uh, uh, funeral. Um, I guess the big news around here, of course, is what's happened in the last week, the last three weeks. What a tremendous playoff season that we had and uh, continue to have. You know, the Houston Ball Club has been in the post game last five years. In the World Series, last two out of the last five years. It's remarkable baseball in our area. I had the thrill of uh, attending game six last Friday with my son. And I've been to the World Series games, but that was the most exciting game I've ever been to. The fans were really into it. In fact, it started out in a very cool uh, Mattress Mac, who was the all everybody knows is a, a furniture salesman here in town, invited some nuns who were big time Astro fans to come to the game. And he picked out one of the gals, one of the nuns to throw out the first pitch. I'm not going to say she was small, but she was pretty diminutive. She wasn't a very big girl. And she was proud as she could be. So she went out to the mound to throw out the first pitch. And she got to the mound and said, well, maybe it's a little far for me. So she started walking in a little bit. And everybody was cheering for her, of course. And she takes the baseball and she throws the strike to orbit. Then bounce it, <clears throat> not to the right, not to the left, but she throws the strike to orbit. Then after she's done that, she does something. She points up to heaven and she goes. <laughs> it's, well, it's our time. <laughs> that, we kind of knew something good was going to happen after that. But uh, uh, the city is celebrating. Uh, we're very happy to have the home field advantage for the first two games. And it goes seven. We have the home field for the last two. Uh, and I understand from the folks in Las Vegas that the Astros are now favored to win and to beat the Braves. And we all support that a thousand percent. <laughs> so that was really terrific. Did you hear in Los Angeles that they accused the Braves of cheating? <laughs> oh, otherwise, they have been in the World Series. <laughs> Give me your well, love. I'm going to say something. In fact, the media has been rather rather hard on our team. Yeah. In fact, Mark, Mark Warnick is one of our members has written a number of letters and emails to various media types I'm saying, come on, guys, lighten up a little bit. And, uh, of course, he's got no response back from uh, the media, but he's – Feels like it's completely been unfair to our players, and only what five players left around the 2017 team. Well, did you see the popular meme that's going around today? Got the entire United States pictured blue, skid, use some orange. And they said, 
those rooting for the Braves and those rooting for the Express. I guess you're right. Uh, on Saturday, uh, we have a, a vintage baseball team who had a surprise. We've had for 10 years, Mike. Right? Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we we delight in playing in exhibitions. And we were asked to participate in the uh, Texan Ranch Day. That's the George Ranch. And we've done that most every year. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Well, it, Joe's got a bunch of great pictures that his wife took. But anyway, we went out there. We played a six-inning game because we had a, we had a time limit. Yeah. And uh, one of the great things that happened was that the Houston Babies were playing the um, Barker Red Sox. Oh, <laughs> and they had Red Sox across their uniforms, okay? Well, we played six innings, so the bottom of the fifth, <laughs> the Houston Babies scored seven runs to win the ball game. Can you think of another team that scored seven runs in the later Getting, <laughs> I guess, the Red Sox. Never happened. Never had a time. You know, we thought that was really terrific. Really terrific. Um, incidentally, we did have a contest that uh, about everybody in this room entered called the Astros Win Contest. And Joe, I don't know if you got a slide of it or not. Uh, no, it's on Facebook. It's on Facebook. Anyway, we had a tie. And we have two guys, two gentlemen, who predicted the correct number of wins. They are Greg Moore and John Hudak. Mark, Mark Hudak, excuse me, Mark Hudak. John Hudak's pitched for the, uh, pitch for the Astros. Uh, the range went from 102 wins predicted by Tom Clemens to 78 predicted by... Greg Lucas. <laughs> Josh Smalley. I mean, uh, well, they did win 78. <laughs> so, we had a lot of fun. We had 35 people enter the contest that we had every year. And uh, it's interesting uh, what did happen. Oh, it's like going back to the babies real quick. One thing I forgot to say, I apologize for this, but one of our members sang the national anthem for the crowd, the baseball team, and for all the cranks who were there. And we had a pretty good sized number of cranks or fans who came to the game. We also had a musical group behind us called the Tanners, and they played when we were finished. And we noticed they all stood up and they saluted and they sang along with Mike. He did a very nice job singing. Then he turned into the umpire and it was a blind Tom. We won't talk about that. <laughs> but it was a fun day. Wish more of you had been out there. Um, don't play as often as we used to. And candidly, we get older <laughs> and older, kind of like our group here. Live for Travis. Yeah, I said, well, he didn't play for us, so Travis. <laughs> <laughs> but we did. Travis came out of the stands. One of, the, one of our players' wives came out of the stands. So uh, we made sure we had nine people on the phone at all times. But it was, it was a fun little one. Um, today, our agenda is going to be, uh, we're going to have a guest speaker from Baltimore. Uh, Peter Kubal will speak. Peter's on the screen up here. He'll speak in a few minutes. And then Chris Chesnut has a, uh, a research presentation he's going to make about uh, winning percentages by innings. Kind of fascinating to wait looks. And then I'm going to talk about a brand new Sabre initiative that was announced Friday that I think has a lot of merit. I think this chapter wants to participate. So unless there are any questions, why well, Red has the hardest trivia we'll ever go to get. It's bragging about it already. Okay. Well, of course we have Trev. There's no question about that. Yeah. And Fred has some books too. You know, we had a book exchange last meeting, and Fred had been kind enough to bring some more books to the back of the room. What's the picture? And uh count for the color Fred put it on the letter now. And I must acknowledge we have a a long time associate of this chapter, a good friend of this chapter who was here tonight, Mike Acosta. Mike, welcome. I worked for the Astros for a long time and he heads up the uh, All Fame Selection Committee. Um, 
for the for the ball club. And, uh, so I'm also lucky enough to be on that uh, team with him. Is he going to authenticate your clipboard and pencil tonight so he can sell them to the at the team store? <laughs> we might get some money for him. Tomorrow the next day. <laughs> okay, uh, Peter and I've been talking for some time. Uh, Peter is the vice president of the Sabre chapter in Baltimore. Very, very active in their chapter. He's done a lot of great things. He's also the head chairman or vice uh, volunteer at the Babe Ruth Museum in Baltimore, which is a very impressive museum, which we all hope to see in Baltimore this summer. And he can talk to us about that, and then he's going to fill us in on what is going to happen, what proposed for the annual convention in, in Baltimore. So, Peter, welcome, and take it away. All right. Uh, good evening, guys. I'm uh, on the East Coast. I'm an hour ahead of you. I uh, want to apologize if I start coughing or whatnot. I'm still a little under the weather, so please uh, excuse any um, behavior. Um, wearing my Babe Ruth birthplace hat. Um, they are not my primary employer, but I've been affiliated with them, uh, actually starting as a volunteer and then getting onto paid staff. Um, I've been with them over a little, about 14 and a half years now. Um, I am the volunteer coordinator. And um, for those of you who've never been to Baltimore, uh, the Babe Ruth birthplace is actually the house the Bambino was born in. Um, it's about two and a half blocks from Camden Yards. Um, those of you who may have read uh, Jane Levy's book, The Big Fella, probably discusses a lot of his childhood and, and everything in the downtown before he was uh, sent to the reform school. But his, the house he was actually born in belonged to his maternal grandparents, uh, the Schomburger family. Uh, when his mom was pregnant and when she went into labor, she just happened to be at her parents' home. And the midwife was called, and the babe was uh, gave, delivered upstairs on February 6, 1895. Um, don't want to go into the history of his, his life and whatnot. It's well documented. Um, and everything he did uh, as a child, and then through St. Mary's, and then on to the baseball career. But the museum opened in, um, was actually way, way back in the 1960s, the area downtown near the ballpark was, from what I understand, um, pretty much a slum. And the house was actually set to be demolished. And the city saved it. Uh, someone took note of the historical significance of the building, which is, contains four row homes. And the foundation was started and renovations and all that kind of stuff took several years. And the original birthplace, the actual house he was born in, opened in 1974. Um, over the next decade, uh, thanks to contributions from the Orioles and, and other institutions and stuff, the birthplace was able to expand into the neighboring three houses. So the museum actually takes up the original ha house, which was remodeled back to the period um, where, when he was born. And of course, a lot of the exhibits in the neighboring homes. Um, it's open year round, obviously COVID took a, we took a hit like everybody else. And um, basically it's been in operation since 1974. Uh, the Babe Ruth Birthplace Foundation, which operates the museum, is also the archives um, for the Orioles. Um, and we used to have a second museum location um, that was open for, I guess, a little over a decade that was right next to Camden Yards that was called Sports Legends Museum that was all other sports in Maryland. Um, Orioles, minor league baseball, all the colleges, the Negro Leagues, pro football, um, anything, horse racing. And that existed in 2015 and then with recessions and riots and rising rents. Um, we had to discontinue it because it was just not financially feasible. So a lot of that stuff we still have, but it, a lot of it is uh, currently in storage while we look for a new location. So um, the birthplace um, has a good relationship with the Ruth family. For any of you who don't know, Babe Ruth's daughter, um, Julia, passed away in 2019 at 102. Um, she was not biologically his daughter, but she was Claire's daughter from her first marriage. Babe legally adopted her 
and actually later gave her a blood transfusion. So then she was actually connected to him directly by blood. And she always referred to him as daddy. Um, we had a wonderful relationship with her up until the day she died. And um, we're, we're still involved with the family. Uh, Babe Ruth name and trademark, as you can imagine, sells. Um, like Elvis Presley, even though the man's been dead 70 plus years, um, his face, his logo, anything that uh, kind of has his stamp on it still, still sells like hotcakes. Um, so we carry a lot of Babe Ruth merchandise. Uh, it's authenticated by the family. Uh, we do much better, obviously, in the summer months. Um, the Orioles, unfortunately, the last couple of seasons have not been great. Um, so that does affect foot traffic and with COVID restrictions. But uh, we're here, we're back on our feet. Um, we're doing pretty darn well, um, all things considered um, during the pandemic. And uh, you know, look forward to, to next summer. The shifting gears slightly, um, the Baltimore chapter of Saber came into existence only in 2015. Uh, I know you guys hosted uh, the National Convention in 2014 in Houston. I uh, was hoping to go to that year, but I was a newlywed and then I ended up losing my job. So I had to take a pass and ended up doing my first convention the next year in Chicago. But um, we came in existence in 2015, thanks to the hard work of a lot of individuals um, who wanted to see a chapter in Baltimore. They're for in Sabres history, the oldest, and for the most part was actually the largest chapter, Bob David's chapter was based in Washington, DC. And, um, and held a lot of his events in DC and the DC suburbs, but basically encompassed all of DC, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, parts of Pennsylvania, Delaware, and down into the Carolinas. Um, and a lot of Sabre members who were from Maryland, Northern Maryland, um, and up into Pennsylvania, didn't want to go to Washington. This is before the Zoom days, of course, um, for a lot of their events. So eventually some um, people smarter than me got together and made a push and we created the Baltimore Bay Ruth chapter in 2015 and um, did pretty well right out of the gate. We ended up stealing the president from the Bob Davids chapter because he actually lives closer to Baltimore than he does to DC. And um, in conjunction with the birthplace and, and holding some of our meetings there and at Camden Yards, um, we grew pretty, pretty well. Um, over the years, so much so that by 2017, there was already uh, whispers that we would be hosting a national convention for Sabre 50. Um, I was told that personally by the then Sabre CEO um, in Manhattan. And of course, it was announced in 2019. I don't know if you guys went to the last, any of you were at the convention in San Diego, um, which was fun, um, that Baltimore had it for 2020. And of course, we all know what happened um, in, in 2020. And we've been bumped and bumped and bumped and bumped and bumped. Uh, luckily, um, Scott Bush and the folks at Sabre and Phoenix have rolled with the punches. Um, they've kept tabs on the field. Uh, they wanted to keep it in Baltimore. Because um, I believe there was a way back in the early days of Sabre, might be in the early 80s, there was a national convention um, in the Baltimore suburbs in Towson at the, held at the university. And then they came into the city for a game at um, Memorial Stadium. So, but it has not been in, in Maryland since. It's been in Washington, it's been in Philadelphia, um, but not in Baltimore proper. Um, so now next year, 2022, it will finally hopefully happen in August. Um, it's later than it's been in the past. Usually it's been in late June or early July, but, uh, the um, folks at Sabre wanted to make sure that we coincided with home game because that would not be a fun for a lot of fans who came to a convention and there wasn't, uh, um, the Orioles wouldn't be at home during that time frame. And um, the Orioles are very excited to um, be intertwined with this. Uh, Peter, Peter, that was June, June 82. 82. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Um, to let you guys know, I don't know if Houston, if, if your chapter had a tie-in with this, Baltimore is doing a book tie-in. Sabre's putting out a book. Um, 
that basically is the, the history of the games in Baltimore, um, professionally, obviously, going back to the 1860s. Um, Baltimore is a very old city, you know, and it kind of gets forgotten being in between Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, and, you know, on the pipeline up to New York. Um, so Bill Nowlin, as most of you recognize that name, um, started putting this together way back in 2019, pre-pandemic, and uh, it's actually finally done as to being released um, earlier than convention to uh, get people interested and, um, you know, obviously sell some copies for Christmas and that kind of thing. Um, Sabre, for those of you, I assume you're all Sabre members and on the list, you should get a link from uh, Jacob later in the week for the, um, the electronic version that we all get free downloads. Um, and of course, you can buy the, the paperback copy. Those of us who contributed um, got it uh, in the mail about a week and a half ago. And uh, it, it looks great. I believe about 54 Sabre members from all over the country um, contributed to it. And there actually will be an official book launch. I'm going to get this right. November 13th at the museum where a couple of us who, who contributed to it, who live in the Baltimore region, will be there talking about it and signing and um, some in-person copies and stuff will be carried in the museum's gift shop. So, um, you know, 2022, it's two years later than we, we wanted for the convention. Um, we're hoping to land several Hall of Famers. Um, you know, the Orioles had a pretty storied history there for a long time. Um, unfortunately, several have passed away of, of the immortal names. But um, we're hoping in working with the Orioles to have people on a panel. Um, originally in 2020, we would have had several anniversaries that tied in with Baltimore baseball history. Of course, it was the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Negro Leagues in 2020. It was also, from a Babe Ruth standpoint, the 100th anniversary of his first season in New York, where everything changed um, after that. Um, and also in Baltimore history, it was 50 years um, since the 1970 uh, Orioles World Champions, which was a, a juggernaut of the team, and 25 years since Cal broke um, Lou Gehrig's record in, in uh, 1995. So, of course, all of those topics and more will probably be part of uh, panels and presentations um, next summer in August. Um, the Grand Hyatt Hotel is literally about eight blocks from where I live, so I have no excuse not to go the convention. Um, we're looking forward to, to hosting everyone from all over the U.S. Um, according to Sabre history, the um, conventions on the East Coast seem to do better number-wise. Um, Baltimore was selected because it hadn't had one in forever, and also um, it's a lot cheaper of a city than um, Philadelphia, New York, D.C., and some of the other uh, East Coast baseball um, locations. So um, looking forward to seeing you guys next August, obviously. Um, Babe Ruth Birth Museum will be part of the tour. Um, I'm sure there will be a panel on Ruth and, and all that kind of stuff downtown. Um, August, let me get the dates right. I think it's the August 17th to the 21st. So towards the end of the summer, but it's still hopefully vacation season for most people. Um, pending no pandemic flare-ups, uh, those dates are locked in. We will be playing Boston that weekend during a homestand. Um, so that'll be a pretty big draw. And uh, I also volunteer with the Orioles as a, a member of the program they call the Designated Hitters, where I help sell on a volunteer basis uh, tickets. Um, so I get to go to a lot of games since I live literally a, a mile from the ballpark in the warehouse. Um, so it's one of the, the many perks of living downtown and not having children and being able to have a lot of free time uh, in the evenings. Um, I guess that's about it off the top of my head. I can go into you know, greater detail on any number of, of Baltimore and Baltimore related topics. Um, I know we have an academic presentation after I'm done um, to go to. So I'll let you guys fire away with the questions, comments, anything else. Uh, you know, I didn't prepare a a slideshow or anything like that because you guys are going to see the city hopefully next summer in person so i'll let the some of the mystique stay that way for for now 
Um, and actually next April, we'll be celebrating the 30th anniversary of Camden Yards. I'm sure that will be a big topic uh, at the convention as well, because if there wasn't a Camden Yards, you guys would probably still be in the Astrodome and there would be Veteran Stadium in Philadelphia. And we've been dealing with the giant uh, concrete donuts that we all love to hate. So um, questions, comments, anything else? I do apologize. I was actually supposed to be down in Houston um, and I was gonna meet with Bob um, and Joe. I was gonna come the first weekend of uh, October, for the last regular season uh, games and come see an Astros game. I've never been to Houston and then go see the new ballpark at Arlington. Um, but I fell ill and I ended up in the hospital a few days later. So I had to, to scrap that, but I hope to maybe next summer get down to see your, uh, your wonderful city and everything I've heard um, about it and see if it's all true. <laughs> I've got a question, uh, Peter, uh, Bob. Um, one of the things that I've enjoyed at previous convention is a tour of old time ballparks, ballparks that are maybe no longer in existence. We did that in Philadelphia. We did that in Cleveland. Uh, we did it here. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't do it in San Diego or New York. Uh, are you all working on something like that where there can be a tour maybe on uh, the day before the convention or on Sunday morning? Uh, yes, we're hoping to do that. We have uh, ballpark experts who are part of the, the, um, the chapter. Actually, a couple of them are officers. And luckily in Baltimore, a lot of the early ballparks fall within the same neighborhood. Um, actually, the Peabody Heights Brewery, if you guys want to look it up, is uh, a brewery. The, the gentleman who owns it is our chapter treasurer, um, sits on a site of Oriole Park 5. Um, which is uptown, uh, north of the Inner Harbor. And uh, Sabre actually helped pay for a, um, a marker, historical marker that was installed this past spring. Um, I went to the Chicago convention and they did a, a bus trip, I think that was the last day of the convention, that was an a la carte add-on that went to all the, the sites in Chicago, professional parks. And I really enjoyed that. Um, we are hoping to make that part of it and include, you know, Negro League parks. Um, we have the experts logistically, you know, have to figure it out if it's going to be something you can add on extra or it's going to be part of the all you can, if you buy the all-inclusive package, assuming savers still do that, that headquarters sets all that kind of stuff up. But that is on our agenda. Um, there's also looking to be a walking tour of the area around Camden Yards, or at least a, a map um, where you can go and see some of the sites that are affiliated with Babe Ruth. Now, he did live, um, when he was with his parents before they sent him to the reform school, he did live in several homes, and some of them are in not so great areas, uh, you know, this stage of the game. Um, so he wouldn't want people to go somewhere where they wouldn't feel comfortable but the areas right around Camden Yards um, where his dad has saloons and, and whatnot um, would probably be part of a, a walking tour. So yes, we're looking to do the, the, a bus trip of all the ball ballparks. Because for those of you who um, pick this book up or download the PDF or whatever, when it comes out from Jacob later in the week, um, there, there's an article on every ballpark. Um, Bugle Field from the Negro Leagues, everything going back, primarily bit written by the same author, David Stinson, who's on our board, who's a um, Baltimore baseball expert. Um, so you will learn, you know, can learn about the ballparks ahead of time and where they're located and, and stuff. Um, inside this book, aside from the articles on individual ballparks, it's uh, there's articles on uh, games of note um, of the National League Orioles, the early American League Orioles before they left for New York, the International League Orioles, the minor league team, um, and of course the, the modern day franchise as well. Um, I contributed two articles, and but there's people here who did six, seven, and eight, and they're you know everything I've read so far is it's wonderful. Um, Baltimore's had an interesting baseball professional history of kind of start and stop and start and stop. Um, it was in the National Association and uh, American Association, and you know absorbed into the National League, and then they folded, and then the American League, and you know, kind of here and there and here and there and here and there. 
And then of course the modern Orioles moved from um, St. Louis in, in uh, 54 and have been here ever since. Um, but uh, you know, people who are true baseball fans uh, of Baltimore baseball know about the other Orioles incarnations, but not everybody does. And um, this book and hopefully the convention will, will touch on that and how important uh, baseball has been and, and the big names who've come out of this region, not just Baltimore proper, all of Maryland, uh, you know, gone on to become um, histor historical names, Jimmy Fox, Al K line, you know, whatever folks who didn't necessarily play for a Baltimore franchise, but became immortals in their own right. I haven't checked the schedule, but will Washington be home during this same period? Is there a possibility? I believe, and I, I looked at it, and I, I, it's not in front of me. Washington will not be home during the weekend, but I think for those people who like to stay an extra couple days, I think they will be home like on Monday or Tuesday after the conventions ended. Um, for those of you who don't know, DC is only about 40 miles south of Baltimore, easily accessible by auto or, or, or train. Um, so, but they, 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 do, they will not be home this exact same weekend. Um, there is a distinct possibility. One of the Orioles minor league teams who are excited as, as heck to have the convention here might have an event, um, over the weekend as well for people who are interested. The Bowie Bay Sox were the double A team. Um, it's about 30 miles away down closer to Annapolis. Um, interestingly, you guys know about Major League Baseball usually does um, the Little League Classic game every year um, where two teams play in Williamsport. Uh, the weekend that the convention is going on, Baltimore will play Boston Friday and Saturday here, and normally would be Sunday would be a day game. That will actually, Baltimore and Boston will be playing a couple hundred miles away up in Williamsport. So cool. sticking around on Sunday, more than likely we will have a game at Bowie, or Aberdeen um, to see the Orioles minor league affiliate, um, which is, you know, in, in the, excuse me, in the Baltimore suburbs. So um, while you, you guys are looking, I'm going to, I'm going to try to look at Washington's schedule the next year and tell you. Down. So fire away. Who owned the order? Who is the owner of the Orioles? <clears throat> The owners of the Orioles. Who owns the Orioles? Who owns the Orioles? It's still the yeah. Andrews family are the uh, the primary owners. Um, he bought the team out of bankruptcy in what 1990. Uh, Mr. Angelos is very, very, very ill, from what I understand. Um, so even though his name is on the letterhead, his his two sons, um, both of them are attorneys, um, basically run the club. And were the ones who um, brought in Mike Elias and his regime uh, after the 2018 season. Since, since the Orioles are going through what the Astros went through 10 years ago, are the Orioles drafting well to make for the future? Yes, they are. They actually, right now, they have the number one farm system in the majors, um, according to. Um, you know, all those people who rank uh, everything. So they, uh, they've they done pretty well. They have some, some big names upcoming. Just a lot of them aren't on the Major League roster yet. So you might have to wait a few more years before you see any, uh, you know, progress at the, um, you know, at the Major League level. Um, I was hoping for a little bit more progress this year. Uh, pitching is still... Big, 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 big problem. Uh, Cam Yards is a is a is a hitter's park, um, so it's hard to to get big free agents and stuff to come here. But at the same time, you know, you got to work with what you have, and uh, hopefully, in the the very near future, there will be a uh, you know, standing wise. Yes, I have a question. Um, what is your opinion on the player Chris Davis retiring this year after um, the hit, some hip problems in the beginning of the year and last year? Well, honestly, I, I you wanted to see the guy do well because he did so well several years here after we got him from, from the Texas Rangers. 
Um, and he signed a big deal. And like a lot of those big deals, it one in, one of its, its back end, he's going to be paid forever. Um, like the same way uh, Bobby Bonilla and Manny Ramirez are being played by their clubs and they've been retired forever. Um, he was a fan favorite. People wanted to see him do well. Um, he's done a lot for the community in terms of charity and donations and being involved and whatnot. Um, but after that year when, you know, he set the record for going oh for whatever, that must've been 2018 or 19 already. And uh, you, you knew he was on the downhill sliding, just never got that swing back. And uh, next year, 2022 was the last year of his deal. Um, and then when they put him on the, you know, the, the injured reserve for the entire season this year, we were like, well, he's pretty much done. Maybe we'll see him a little bit next year, but that'll be it. So it, it shocked me personally that he announced his retirement, um, but it's for the betterment of the team. Um, they're still paying him from everything that I understand. They're going to honor the deal. Um, whether he's going to have a role with the team or not, I'm not sure. Um, you know, you still see a lot of his jerseys and t-shirts in the, uh, uh, in the stands, but he fell off overnight and, and never got that, whatever he had back. Um, and, uh, feel bad for the guy because, you know, career can't end, uh, prematurely. And I think that's what happened in, in his case, but, um, enough people have stepped up and, and filled the roles of Mancini's and we had Mount Castles in running for the year this year. Um, and so, you know, we're good at first base. We're good with sort of the power kind of players. Now we need some, some finesse guys and, and some big pitching and we'll be, uh, we'll be okay. I'll miss Chris, but since he hasn't been potent in the lineup for two or three seasons, you know, the team statistically really isn't missing him. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know about the Houston connection. With Mike Elias, he was yeah. here before. You guys, I think Zig went off up there also. Do you think yep. Mike's in trouble? I think Mike's in any kind of trouble because of the performance of the team. No, I haven't heard anything. People, there've been whispers about you know the manager who who he selected um, when he when because Show Walter was here through 2018, and then cleaned house, and the um, when the Elias regime came in with Sig. And they picked Brandon Hyde, who had been um, an assistant under Joe Madden in the Cubs. So obviously had, had you know, been in the postseason and, and won it all and been through all that stuff. Um, there's been whispers about getting rid of the manager and he's, he's not tough as nails. Or are they just sitting on him just so they get better and then they'll go out and, and, and hook a big name? Or will they bring up somebody through the Orioles minor league system? Um, yeah, there hasn't been anything in terms of calling for Elias's head, but we, there's been a lot, uh, you know, hot seat stuff under under the manager. But apparently, he's he's safe uh, at least through next year. So, um, I've met Elias uh, once or twice. Nice, nice guy. Brief conversations. Um, Stig is more than likely going to be one of the uh, keynote speakers at the, um, or at least originally was when it was going to be in 2020. Um, hopefully, he's still on board. Um, there's one of the, like a, I don't know if the welcome address or, or whatnot, I'm not in charge of lining up all the speakers, but, um, I do sit on the planning committee and, uh, some of the names and stuff they've thrown around, you, you guys would uh, recognize for, for sure. Um, of course we're still a little over, a little less than 10 months away. Um, so will the Orioles be out of the basement next year? Some of their... If Rutschman and, and some of the, the guys who were in double and triple A last year, I don't think they'll start in the majors in the spring, but they might come up when the service time, depending on how that goes with the collective bargaining and the, if the dates change, if they come up by May or June, you could probably see um, improvement. The AL East, as you know, is pretty consistently stacked. Um, Tampa, Toronto, Boston, you know, you, you just can't win. Um, you have to wait for somebody to have a, an off year and, and take advantage of it. Um, but uh, the Orioles, the, the rumor always is, was, is that they're going to leave someday. Um, uh, it's not profitably in Baltimore. Uh, so many fans left the Orioles when Washington came into existence and, and go to you know their park uh, 40 miles away. Um, so there's always been rumors that maybe the Orioles will pick up and move to Memphis, but 
I highly doubt Major League Baseball will ever allow Baltimore to leave, given this year and and the ballpark is is so classic. Um, you know, my personal opinion, and it is it's a baseball town when they're winning, and it's a football town. Uh, otherwise, Baltimore is not a large city. It's only about six hundred thousand in population, um, but uh, so they only have the two professional major level sports here. But um, you know, they don't both do well. I mean, we won. We were in the playoffs three three times in five seasons, and uh, you know, I went to a couple of playoff games, and the crowds were there. And then, of course, when you start going on your down uh, climb, and then COVID hit, you know. We basically had you know nobody this year. I don't even know if we got a million fans. Um, of course, there was pod seating and stuff for the first several months, but uh, you know the loyalty is there, the tradition is there. You just got to get the the right combination of players um, to, the, to develop that relationship with the fans. Um, we had that with Adam Jones, and um, I think we probably can have it with. Uh, Mancini and Mullins and stuff now to a certain extent, especially homegrown players. Um, but, you know, I don't know how it is in Houston. I mean, you guys have a, a lot of all-stars and they've done well in the last half decade really well. Um, I'm still mad. I did pull for you in 2019. I know all the cheating stuff came out about that after the 19 season, about 17. But I pulled for you guys against the pretzel hats and you couldn't do it. So um, I don't like the pretzel hats. I was like, why the, why the hell they're allowed to have the Walgreens logo? I'll never understand. Um, um, you know, um, you know playoffs, um, I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted because I know Dusty deserves a title, but technically he got 17. Uh, and, you know, the Braves haven't won since 95. I also feel for the Braves because, they you know, we lost Hen- Hank Aaron this year. And, you know, in a, in a certain way, you know, they're probably playing in, in his memory because obviously he's one of the, the best of the best of the best. Um, so it, it, it should be interesting, you know. Um, I went to actually a play, playoff game I went to was in 2019. I saw, I didn't go to the World Series, but I did go to the uh, game four of the NLCS in D.C. because they don't have a lot of diehard fans by any means down there. And I was able to get tickets the day of the game from MLB directly in good, pretty good seats in the second deck. And my wife and I went, so we were there the night that uh, Washington swept the Cardinals and won the pennant. Oh, can I get some of the chats? Chat questions? I don't know if it's a chat. Probably feel. I have to get back. Okay. It's been a while since I've been there. But, so, Peter, I have a question. This is a joke. I, I, uh, last time I was in Baltimore, I just went through three with 94, but this is the first time I've ever gone to the museum. Um, let's say somebody new walking into the museum, they know a lot of it, they know a lot about Babe Ruth, but they want to learn something new. You know, about Babe Bruce, they never really heard of. Is there something you would tell them, somebody like me, you've never heard about, about Babe Bruce? Well, people are always are under the, the misunderstanding. And of course, this is based on faulty going back in decades. People always think, always hear that he was sent to an orphanage. So they always assume he was an orphan. Um, so if you clear that up, the, the story for many years was well, his parents couldn't control him, he was incorrigible. He was basically a, a ruffian and a, and, a, and a mini outlaw. So the courts sent him to, to the um, to St. Mary's Industrial School because it was an orphanage and it was a, a court ordered facility. Um, but it was also a boarding school, which people don't realize. Um, thanks to Jane Levy and who uncovered a lot of things and some of the deep, dark family secrets about his parents while he was away, um, ended up divorcing and everything. His mom had a, an alcohol issue. Um, he was sent to St. Mary's because his parents didn't have time for him. His dad basically had a deal with his mom, who was a nightmare and, you know, like I said, had, had uh, health problems. Um, but they basically paid um, the school, the boarding school, to, to take care of him and actually signed legal custody 
over to the priests there. Um, that's a big misconception that, uh, that people have. Another thing is a lot of people don't realize he played for Baltimore. Um, right out of St. Mary's, he was signed to the then minor league Orioles. He was basically a triple A team. This is before there were farm clubs affiliated directly with uh, parent clubs, but he played for the minor league Orioles for a few months and they were hemorrhaging money. And um, he ended up having to be packed together in a deal and was sold to, to Boston, uh, the Red Sox. Um, and he almost, almost went to the Cincinnati Reds. And he almost went to the Philadelphia Athletics. So, you know, history could have been a lot different if he had gone to a different franchise. Um, so, I mean, there's a million and one stories. And like I said, the man's been dead 70 plus years. Uh, more and more info comes out now. Um, thanks to digital archives and, and, and whatever. Um, but uh, you'd be surprised what people think they know and then end up dis discovering. Well, Boston traded him. No, they sold it. Um, oh, he ended his career with the Yankees. Well, no, he actually, the Yankees released him and he played the last couple of months of his career for a National League team, the Boston Braves. So, um, you know, the non-Saber diehard kind of people um, love to get that swelled head thing. I know everything. And, and you throw out some facts and stuff, and then you have to, uh, end up, uh, clearing it up. So, um, it's interesting. A lot of people avoid the museum. This will say, I hate the Yankees, so I'm not going to the Babe Ruth Museum. Well, yes, most of his career was in, in, in New York and his best statistical years and, and all that stuff and how he changed the game, et cetera. But what he did for baseball is such much more than just making a franchise um, that uh, we get fans from all over the world and um, especially fans from um, the Far East, from Asia who come in and are just still fascinated um, with all that he did. And then of course the uh, Otani tie-in this year and he's the next Babe Ruth and he's doing things that Ruth hasn't done and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and while he's a phenomenal athlete, you know, let him do that for three or four seasons and then come and talk to me. You know, a, a, a one-off whirlwind um, isn't as impressive to me as a, as a career, um, you know, when you, you know, your ERA is around two. Babe had, what, 94 wins before he stopped pitching. And he did have several saves, actually, even when he was a Yankee. Um, you know, and then there's lifetime slugging for percentage of 690 that, you know, no one on earth has ever come close to career-wise. So, um, you know, the Otani things are, are great for comparison because they keep the, the Ruth's name out there and in, in the um, in the public eye um, in mind. But it's, you know, when the careers come to the end, then we can start comparing Mays and Aaron and this guy and this guy and this guy. And, uh, you know, see, see where the, the spotlight falls at the end of their days. So, but uh, yeah, the museum's going to be lo looking forward to hosting, you know, all you guys next summer. Probably I'm going to think it's included as part of the, um, the convention pass. So if you have like the, the convention lanyard type of thing, you'll be able to go in. But all that stuff will be worked out in the in the, uh, the off season. But um, hopefully uh, at least you get a chance on your own time to you know stop over there and get through. And you'll be like me and uh, find a. Um, I put and I pointed out to the curator a couple times and everything. I'm like. You know this 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 stat this this average doesn't match with this year this this one's wrong and you know all this kind of stuff and that's the way saber people are. Um, <laughs> there's a little inconsistency here or, or whatnot. So um, and you know that's what we do and what we do well. But uh, you know just the the, the history of, of baseball in Baltimore, which includes Ruth obviously as his hometown, is a uh, it's, it's pretty immense. Um, and uh, we're hoping Saber is hoping headquarters. Um, the largest convention to date so far, attendance wise, was the Manhattan one in 17, I guess that was. Because um, I didn't go to Miami because I was sick that year. So I did. Yeah, so Manhattan was 17, and that was a little over 800. So they're hoping for, not, for 900 to 1,000 um, next summer here. Is it true? Is it true that Babe almost died during the pandemic of 1918? Yeah, they said he had the he had he caught the, the Spanish flu on two, multiple occasions. So that, the guy seemed to have a lot of close calls, car accidents, and you know, and this and that. Um, but yeah, he he survived. 
and obviously his life was cut short with the cancer he ended up getting and he, you know, he died in his early fifties, but, um, but for whatever reason, he was meant to do what he did and uh, transform the game. Um, and anything he's touched, um, I don't know if you guys follow the memorabilia market, things with his signature or that he wore or whatever, you know, there's jerseys that have gone for four and five million dollars over the past several years. Like he is, the, um, and I have a book somewhere. It's like Babe Ruth being a master marketer. I forget the exact title. Probably 2019, 2020. And how, you know, every, he's just still the, 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 the platinum level of, uh, of, of collectibles. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it's, it's phenomenal that yeah, most other sports, and I don't really follow any other professional sports aside from baseball, kids don't know the major players of the game. You know, five, ten years after they're out of the limelight or they retire, you kind of forget, who's this? You know, so while it's LeBron James and this guy's up today, you ask a kid who Julius Irving is or Larry Bird or whomever who played, you know, 30, 35 years ago, I have no idea. Football's the same way. If I mentioned to a kid, Dan Marino or, or you know, whomever, they won't know. They only know the, the, the here and now. Um, baseball treats its legends much more like royalty and the names are sort of ingrained in your mind and they're in the stars. Um, you know, there's, you know, people all over the world, man's been dead since 1948 and people know who Babe Ruth is and we'll say baseball and Yankees and this and home run and, you know, all the other things that come to mind. Um, and it, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's humbling. Um, I always take the George will approach. Um, when I come to viewing sports, everything else, you know, is back and forth, football, baseball, basketball, hockey. It's all, you know, boom, 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 boom. Um, I like Bell said once on a, I forget what DVD I saw. It said, he's like, baseball is nine players thinly dispersed over an eye pleasing green backdrop. And I was like, you know, that's a, that's a nice poetic way of looking at it. And it's, you know, as you guys know, we're, we're all, all huge fans that it's, uh, there's nothing else left. So, and then hopefully you guys can get a taste of uh, Baltimore baseball, you know, um, next summer. Very good. Do, do any of the stars, uh, the past Orioles golden period, say Jim Palmer or anyone like that, come and promote the Orioles in any way? Like Bichio and Bagwell kind of promote the Astros. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of the, the, the Orioles, uh, I don't know if you can see behind me, I have a, a uh, shelf of, of statues. The Orioles have six retired numbers uh, outside of Jackie Robinson, um, five players and, and one manager um, who 10 years ago, they, they put bronze statues inside the park um, in honor of the 20th anniversary of Camden Yards. Um, most of the Orioles, well, Frank Robinson's past and Earl Weaver's past, but, but Brooks, Robinson, Eddie Murray, and Jim Palmer all work for the Orioles in one capacity or another. Um, Cal has nothing to do with the team legally. So I, I know he comes to games and you, you see him and, and all that kind of stuff. But he owns his little empire of, of youth baseball and the camps and all that kind of stuff. 35 miles up the road is where they're headquartered. You know, he's still a household name. Um, the Orioles, we're lucky we have, uh, he's a Sabre member, the Orioles alumni director. Um, the Orioles do a lot of guys who are not Cooperstown Hall of Famers, but, you know, team legends who still live in the area um, and do signings. And they'll bring guys if you, uh, like if we have a Sabre game at Camden Yards, um, we get a speaker, I'll contact Bill Stetka, he'll get Kenny Singleton or Scotty McGregor or, or one of the, you know, a team great who's in the team hall yeah. to come okay. and do a, you know, a presentation. We have uh, several of them on our uh, Sabre uh, email list, Boo Powell's on our email list and, and whatnot. So they're very approachable. We have a good, we, the chapter, have a good relationship with the, uh, the Orioles uh, front office, Bill Stetka and, um, and a couple other uh, individuals that uh, we have access. Um, we do Zoom calls. We have one of the Orioles announcers uh, Jeff Arnold, who's on Masson and, and radio broadcast, who's talking to us 
in November, you know, and uh, I've become pretty good friends with the, or a public address announcer who's a female this year. Um, and she's talking to our Sabre group and, and whatnot. So we're, we're pretty well intertwined with, with the team. Um, and, uh, you know, around here, as, as I'm sure it's in Houston, you, you celebrate the guys who did the most for your franchise, you know, so Palmer and, and those kind of guys, you know, walk on water. Um, and you, you still see them around the ballpark and they're, they're relatively accessible. Um, okay. I all at, at one point or another, I even got to meet, uh, Frank, uh, Robinson and Earl Weaver before they died. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty lucky here, you know, Un- unfortunately there's, hasn't been a, a, an immortal name since Cal, um, so we've had good players, but you know, not at that threshold, but, uh, you know, Who's coming up through the pipeline? Who's going to be your 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 future for the next two decades? Okay, good job. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. All right, guys, I'm going to end up dropping Great. off because I got a little bit of stuff to do. So, um, any any of you guys need anything? Just email me. Um, and don't forget, you can always join. Go into your profile on in Saber and just join the. Um, the Baltimore chapter, and that way you get our email updates and events too. So if you can't figure it out, just let me know and I can always add you. Yeah, we piggybacked off of those guys uh, for speakers from time to time. They've had some great speakers in Baltimore and Washington. And, uh, that's how we've got hold of a number of the people that we've had on Zoom. So uh, we thank you for that. Uh, yeah, Tony. Thank uh, George Will, I think. Remember, remember, he defines football as professional football as city meeting interspersed with violence. <laughs> oh boy, don't talk football around here. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's switch gears just a little bit. And Chris has come up with a presentation. Um, uh, he'll put on the screen here. I'm shortly. I'm in the way, so you're, I, the way. you're telling me to. Well, it's getting cool in here, isn't it? Too cold. Okay. All right. Scott, don't leave. We got in. You're on the program. What are we doing today, Chris? You can send us one of those pictures. So maybe I can select you. Which one? I'm going to bring that one. Yeah. Okay. Right, let's see if we can make this for her. Series. Really? We want to put some on. Yeah, we'll send right up the deal for the twice. Same. Right? Yeah. 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 You, you, you select which one you want to put on there. Have the write up on there. Yeah. Well, I'll make it. Susan, Susan. 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 Here we go. A baseball chart for morning people. Oh, I mean, um, I can play to watch the Astros on the uh, West Coast playing in Seattle. Game starts at nine, takes three and a half hours to get done. So I want to go to bed with some level of confidence that the team is winning or losing will end up winning or losing. So, that's kind of my question is, 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 can we figure out what the odds are that the team will win if you know what the inning and the score is? So, it's a very simple concept, um, but we're going to use play-by-play data for metric sheet. So, I need to play by play data because I need to see what the score was after each inning. And they have games going all the way back to 1915. And so it's about 175,000 games. And you look at 
at the end of the game what the score is, who's winning, and what the, what the difference is in the score, and then go right to the end and see who won. And so it's just a simple calculation. I mean, there's not. I understand that that if you if you look at the third inning of the score, a lot can happen between them there and the end of the game. So when you put all that data together, you end up with a chart looks something like this. Now I realize this is wow. hard to read and small, so we're going to focus in on the upper left quadrant, which is the visitors, if they're ahead. And those are historical winning percentages for a combination of inning and, and lead. So, for example, if the Astros are in the fourth inning of the game and they have a three-run lead, then historically, they'll win 84% of the time. Now, that's based on the whole chart of 175,000 games. There's about 11,000 of this situation over history and about 9,000 times the visitor won in, in this situation. If you go through 11,000, <laughs> that's a trick. And so uh, this data, you start seeing some, some things that came up, and, and, and I, I want to point out. If you look at tie games in the first eight innings, there's a distinct home field advantage because the visiting team in the tie game only wins 47 or so percent of the time. And as you look in other parts of the chart, similar situations, there is a real home field advantage, maybe because you know, you don't, if you're a tie game, you don't need that many runs to score to win. And when you get to the ninth inning, now this is taken at the end of the top of the ninth. Obviously, if the, if the visiting team is losing, the game is over. But if you really only have a one in three shot of winning the game if they're tied, going in the bottom of the ninth. Um, so I thought they would, you know, I didn't have any idea what was going to be better or worse, but that's what it shows up to in, his, in history. And then you start looking at the importance of one run. So if we go back to the winning percentage of the visiting team in tie games, around 47%, if they have just a one run lead, the winning percentage jumps from 12% in the first inning to a 40% increase by the eighth inning, just with a one-run lead, nothing else going on. So if you if you want to go to bed at the fourth inning, they have a one-run lead, you have a 63% chance the team that's in the lead is going to end up winning the game. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm So I'm going to rest easy knowing that I have to worry about missing something fantastic. And then as I was sending this out, um, a friend of my brother's who's a Sabre member in Sabre in Atlanta saw this and asked, well, how has this changed over time? And I'm like, man, that's a lot of data. So let's simplify it. Just look at the visiting teams, which kind of stick with them, in tie games by the decade. And we're going to look from the sixth inning on because you start getting relief pitchers, which was more predominant in our current time. So in the sixth inning, you'll see it's basically – about the same. There's not much that much difference. Now, as we see in further charts, retro sheet data for the first 50 years, 40 years or so, they don't have all the games. It's not the complete record of play-by-play of, uh, -play data. But from about the 50s and 60s on, they do have basically all the baseball games. So we'll see some impact of that later in the, in the next chart. So the seventh inning, again, it stays about some Something happened in the 70s. I don't have to think about what's going on there that the visiting team had a better chance of winning uh, in the 70s than in the other decades. But it's all fairly consistent, which I was actually a little bit surprised about. And then the eighth inning, again, it's all consistent. It seems like 1910s drops off. Uh, that may be just because of the, um, the amount of available data they maybe have caused issue. And then even the ninth inning, uh, in the 40s, they had a good shot, but it stayed... Even though baseball is played differently, I mean, the, the rules are different, the way they use players are different, it's still, you know, baseball, and you and you have to recognize it from about the 60s on, it really hasn't changed that much as far as winning games with leads. I mean, because really a, a one-run lead is basically a two runs to win. So it, it, it's not... Um, it's not that easy, really, to get two runs all the time. So some of the things we can conclude from this 
is the home team has a, a, a real advantage, a, a noticeable advantage in uh, in these in high games, especially, but even in similar situations in, in other parts of the chart. Even one run is important. Um, I, I, I'm not a manager, I'm a better manager, but, and, and I'm not a major league player, obviously. But you can think that your mindset would be different if you were trailing by a run than if you were hit by a run. Just you would just be feeling some pressure. And so I can see where just one run can make a difference in, in the way the game is, is, is played. And our poor visitors, if they go the ninth inning tied, they're most likely going to lose. So there's the chart again. And then what happened was somebody else I sent this to said they didn't care about baseball before 2000. They said, well, how's this chart look just in the modern game? So it's, I did just one for the 2000, 2000 on. It is basically the same, except you have a smaller pool of games. You have about 50,000 games here. So some of the outlying numbers on the top and bottom are a little bit different, but basically in the core of it, which is, you know, plus or minus four runs, is about the same ratios of winning and losing. Nothing has really changed too much. And then because my brothers in Atlanta and the Braves somehow got the World Series, we did, I did one for the just playoffs. So this is just for the playoffs, which means Richard, you had play-by-play -play data from the 1903 World Series on. This is every playoff game that's been played. There's over 1,600 of them. So it gets a smaller data set, but it shows this one. You can't hardly see the numbers, but the, the tie winning percentage is down a couple of points on the visitor. The, the home team has a bigger advantage in the playoffs. Um, and even in the ninth inning, it's only 31% chance that the visitor is at a 34%. So it has a chance of winning a tie game in the ninth. Um, what this also shows is if you have a full run lead in the ninth inning, you're going to win. <laughs> no one's ever come back from four runs down in the ninth inning and won. So um, they've blown the three run leads, but they, they've never blown one more than four runs. In fact, if you're four run leads in the eighth, you can go to bed. It's just over. Well, it's just the seventh inning. You want to see them jump up and down in the seventh game. So now I have all these charts available. If you want to just email me, uh, I've got them formatted so they print on 11 by eight and a half by 11 sheet. Nice. So what ends up happening is what I really like looking at is, is when you get, I'm going to back up just a second is, is, um, if you have like, it's a 5% chance of winning. Well, you know, if you're, if you're a ranger, you probably like lost, but if you're the Astros, you're a good team. This chart doesn't care how good you are, but you, you, you may think I've got a real shot because playing a, a lesser team. So I like to look at the, um, if, we have, if we have a situation where it's, it's, it's chance are you're going to lose, really good chance, but you end up winning. So, you know, if, you, if, if the games I stay up for, the home games, then yeah, we're always looking at oh, six runs down in the seventh inning. Oh, we still got a shot. It's not over. And, it is historically it's over, but you never know. Things can happen. So again, you can just email me if you want to at this address. Um, what was the information in the seventies that was puzzling? Was the yeah, that was. I don't know why the. Um, let's go back. When they changed the map? When they changed the map? It's in the. It, it's in the yeah, so it's it's um. <clears throat> I didn't analyze why that is that way. Um, it could be. I heard this lecture series on baseball where the guy said um, the home team used to be able to choose whether it would be the bat first or bat second. And that even went into the beginning of Major League Baseball where you could, you know, if you decided you want to be the visitor team that day, whatever it is, you could. There was no rule against it. And then they simplified or they made the rule now the home team bats last. So I don't think it really affects the day of your office. That's too far in, in the past, but yeah, that was a strange, strange thing that kind of goes along. And I thought maybe it was um, like the 40s at one point were worse. But, I, you know, you can see World War II messes up the players that you have. But I don't have an analyzed close enough to. Uh, well, the they built a bunch of cookie and center ballparks for all the same size and all big. And they played pitch and defense. The Astros then were 
uh, scratch is like the run stone and basil measured with the reports. Yeah, when it was Tommy heard it, listen, Kevin runs, but yeah, the one run was a lot bigger in the 70s. So, yeah, I think it happened in the ballparks. No, they did, and that was one of the reasons they built Camden Yard and the rest of us to get some offense back to Kane, and all the pitchers were shorter. Yeah, so. So really, baseball is still baseball, I guess. There's also a period of time where uh, <laughs> say your closer was frequently used for more than one inning. Yes. Which is going to, you know, so if he's really effective, that's, that's, going, to, that's going to enhance your chances. Guys, if you would go three in and yeah. on. But it it it's so much. So the starters, Ted Gossett, Suter, effortfully. Like, so I want something simple that I put on a chart and not worry about calculating some kind of win probability and some kind of high level math. Just sitting there with a piece of paper in my hand when the wife says, We still watching this game? Is it seven or nothing? I said, We have a 3% chance of winning this thing. <laughs> yeah. so, you win a lot of arguments with, with if you have a scientific chart in your hand. So that's a real interesting study. How long does it take you to put this together? Uh, it took a while because I had to, it's, it's, um, 175. the 175,000 games, which is times nine innings, plus, because you have to look at all the extra innings, too, so it gets the, a big data set. Once, it's, once you get the, once you get the data out of retro sheet, then it's just a matter of, of, uh, you know, letting it calculate out, but it took a while, but after that, it was, it was, uh, but the playoff one was simple, because all the formulas were set up, and all they do is, and the data was just separate. A much smaller data set to deal with. You know, yeah, you're going to probably that national combustion. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. You ought to answer that. Good. You'll have to put that. Right. Well, you think we're going to not wonder about this stuff and we just get a beer? I'm going to go. Chance of winning. Uh, Chris, do you think maybe uh, in the 70s, that's the decade where a lot of teams installed AstroTurf? You think that might have changed the game? So let's get into what. The parks are basically the same. Yeah, but I mean, so, asphalt turf changes. Yeah, but the plane surface and makes it yeah. faster after you think maybe that's some. Well, they gave sure. But teams are kind of constructed. If you have all the same ballparks, the yeah, the, the DH was added in the 70s also. Yeah. 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 That was the first year of it. Maybe they didn't, the first decade they added, maybe it was a, a different. I don't know. We're just looking for variables uh, that explains it. Well, there's going to be a whole lot. I mean, all they have a little piece of it. So they get, you know, finding the one that's the, the, the little nugget of gold that says that is the reason why the chart looks like it does. The DH did. I would still maintain the biggest issue is if you're ahead in the seventh inning and you got a suitor out there, you still pitch the eighth and the ninth for you. And you're changing your defense. You're putting in better defense player generally. And so your your team on the field is not at the end is not the same one that started. I mean, if you, and especially if you're built if you're nationally back for the double switching. Um, but it's still kind of after that, it kind of levels out or it's that fall off being the same, same number. But yeah, the managers get a hold of this. We're gonna see them pulling their regular golf. Well, we only got a 22% chance of winning. We're gonna rest these guys. <laughs> but 22%. It, 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 this, but this is this is this has no – this doesn't take into account who you're playing. Um, before we got from Baltimore, their bad staff, this chart may not – I mean, if we did one for each team, you'd probably see a great variant. Then you would be down and who the pitching staff was. Right. Um, so it's kind of this amalgamated point, so you don't really know. That's something I said, you know, hey, look, we're playing Seattle. Well, they've got, you know, some guys. Okay, it's over. We're playing the Boston. You know, you don't expect to be – have a big seven run inning in a playoff. That's kind of well. And I got, I got, I got to say something here. That, that, uh, I, I, the Cubs. I was uh, watching, and they came back to win uh, against the Cardinals before the Cardinals caught fire by winning by getting by scoring nine in the ninth inning. I mean, and the, the Cardinals went on a very hot tear and made the playoffs. No. Nobody saw either one of those things coming. It's not only what team you play, but when you play them. Right. There's a lot. There's a lot of variables. This simplifies it quite a bit yeah. because it's just looking at every team that's ever played yeah. in this situation. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, one 
1915 to 2020. That's the major league we're paired together. No, why not? You have the other one. I can find it, but I, I didn't. I just looked at that. And again, you know, we have. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of games. But again, in the early decades, Retro Sheet doesn't have play by play data for yeah. all those all those games. So it's uh, not a baseball. It's a lot. Of, so that's why, you know, the chart to me, at least it's got everything on there. And so it's, but. As, as the and really as the as the charts as the data gets smaller because you get in the playoffs, um, the bands get smaller, but it's still the same basic idea. If you have a two or three run lead, um, you're in much better shape, obviously, than if you're if you're especially in the playoffs. You don't have that. You get you know the game in that days. Goodness gracious, it's it sort of like go three innings, and then you're into a whole different strategy back in the day when. You know, in the 70s, um, I just read a guy who did a, a kind of a recap of the 71 World Series, and they were, their stars were going seven, eight innings. They were expected to, even in the playoffs, even if they gave two or three runs, they were, you know, Palmer, Cuellar, McNally, Dobson. You didn't expect those guys to be pulled. You were, you know, between that guy in the seventh inning is still probably better than six or seven guys that are in the bullpen. And then, you know they bring the closer and they're in the guy in the game, but even then they would put in Dobson to come in and pitch when he would be on his off day. So they kind of, but it was a different different mindset back then. But it's yeah, it's one game like that, either. So any picture went one game like sixty games. Uh, that guy with the Dodgers went one game. Arius one time. Arius one time. Yeah, I think there's only one out there. Well, it's that, Chris. So again, there's an email address. If you want to get a copy of it, just send it to me. I'll send it to PDF. Easy to print out. Um, my wife laughs at me because I printed mine on hard copy stock so it wouldn't get torn up by the dog. But she just laughs at me. Mocks me. So that's my baseball chart for morning, people. Excellent. Thank you. You bet. Any questions? Any more for Chris? I do think uh, you have to respond to what Tal said and maybe submit this uh, in the next couple of months when they start coming up with the agenda for the national. Mm -hmm. That's a twenty-minute you know, uh, presentation. Yes, please, please submit that, Chris, because the whole Saber community needs to see that. I mean, who amongst us hasn't gone to bed because oh? I'm tired and I can't come back. <laughs> I'd like to see uh, how the first place teams compare to the average. They need to get your staffs out and start to pop. And I'll get 10,000 games. You have to play. Mike. Okay. This is from yeah. a, it's going to say from the standpoint of making your decision. As to whether you're going to stay up or not, when you have to weigh that now with the length of the game. <laughs> well, we didn't. What was the other day we were looking? It's like this. It was a one nothing game. We were three hours in. It was a six inning. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. Okay. Um, Saber. Let's talk about Saber headquarters for a little bit. Um, I've been a little bit critical of the organization. Because in the past, it's focused on raising money and promoting headquarters. Now, I think they made a significant change in that they're trying to help grow the game, but also have some ideas to help catch. I've always said you need to do more to help us grow, make people more aware of who Sabre is. And they've come out just Friday with a brand new program called the uh, Local grants program, which you may or may not have read in This Week in Sabre on Friday. And this is a program where Sabre will provide $10,000 in total to a individual projects that are supported by the chapter, not an individual, it has to be a chapter project, to grow uh, the sport. And there are four basic pillars they talk about that, that uh, they're looking at for uh, possibility of uh, projects. One is for research. Saber's always been into research. They're talking about uh, databases and uh, 
such things that support the chapter's research program. They're talking about preservation. What can the, what can be done to help preserve baseball, uh, in particular, like commemorative plaques at ballparks, which we're going to talk about a little bit. They're talking about scholarship. What can be done uh, to organize research symposiums and chapter research and getting out to the, to the public to make them aware of Sabres? And they're talking about the future of the game. How can we encourage more young people to get involved? Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of potential here. I think there's going to be a lot of competition for people who are going to want to uh, take part and get some money from saving. And I talked to Mike Banks on Friday in some detail. I was hoping Mike would be on the program. I don't think he's here. I hear Mike. But Mike Banks has been extremely successful in the past in getting ballpark markers put up around Houston. He's got one out there uh, at the Astrodome. He's got one West End Park. Uh, he had to work very diligently with the Historical Commission, with the county, with the city, and with other entities to get them to agree to put up a marker. But they wouldn't provide any money. And he had to find a way to raise the money. This is a way where if Sabre agrees with our project, if we decide that ballpark markers like one at Cole Stadium, and we can get maybe $2,000, we can get a ballpark marker put up there. And I think as Tony told me earlier today, there are at least six locations here in Houston with our former yeah. major league ballpark. Not necessarily major league ballpark, ballparks. And I thought with Mike's expertise, and uh, he's interested in being participating in the program. He doesn't want to do all the work, but he's interested in seeing what can be developed. He knows some of the people who make markers. He knows the costs. He knows who the government officials are. He knows uh, some of the behind the scene activity. If, if we would support a program like this, um, he'd be willing to help put it together. Now, one of the things that is involved is nominations for projects have to be submitted by January 31st. Now, Mike Acosta also knows a lot about ballpark markers. I've been, been uh, behind the scenes on some of these things. I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity, if the chapter thinks it's a good idea, to look into possibility of putting up a ballpark marker or two. Now, this $10,000 will be available every year. It's not just a one-time shot. And so I'd like to kind of kick it around I know it's kind of new to all, all of you as far as what the four pillars are and what ideas we may come up with. But candidly, if we're going to make a submission, we have to make a decision in the next 30 days about what that project should be or could be. Well, we'll get approved or not. I have a feeling that a lot of chapters are going to participate want to ask for uh, some help because Sabre has never had any money available in the past, as we all know, for local activities. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any comments or thoughts about it? Good, bad, or different? Yeah, my points are wrong. Two things. Have you ever given consideration to a marker program inside the debate park or inside the afternoon or future to mark certain milestones or certain things to happen or something that needs to be in that location? At Fenway Park, they have somewhat of a marker program where they label things like this used to be the, the water heater that you know heated I mean literally heated the visiting clubhouse this used to be the original entrance to the original clubhouse and the Astrodome project I'm working on something like that but do you think that could tie into a big part because we always talk about creating a museum a walking museum around that big park where people would not just go to one location, but they would walk and see these old markers. Well, this, this used to be Tiles Hill. <laughs> I'm getting to the Parking with Tiles Base on that. No, no, I don't no, no, think that might be a really great exposure or to save in the ballpark, but it has not happened. And 
just thought, yeah, I'm not familiar with a lot of markers. I know that there's a black up there for Daryl Kyle. And, uh, Okay, well, hey, there's it's very small. The rich yellow black is also like you know, so yeah, yeah, well, yes, yeah. You could do maybe even even call with more regulators. Sorry, or somebody said, "Five and all, or something like that." Yeah, well, they would. The, 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 nobody knows that, but you should. Uh, you do. <laughs> okay, so we go around and we find the ballpark. That was that going to help uh, expand slavery? Uh, and publicity is more than we have right now. Uh, and, you know, have a ceremony and all that kind of good stuff. I know Mike and uh, Mike had a major deal with the uh, with the Antidote when they had that ceremony, had all the local people out there, made television. It was very well done. I had picture. Yeah, and most of us, a lot of us were there. That happened. We went out to West End when we did that. I remember that. It was a black up of the used the lighting and power yeah, yeah. place. And the Tycom used to play there in 05, whatever. So it's true. Uh, in our case, we could actually expand it to Galveston. Yeah, since that's in less than close. We could say we're both there are all parks people first. You know, Bob, from our book, uh, uh, is, is there a marker in the city that marks the spot where they had the first meeting in 1861? But the Houston Baseball Club? Not to my knowledge. I know where it is. But that probably would be yeah. very good. Yeah. You know, so. How was that, Joe? The, the spot where the first meeting took place, April 12th, 1861. Jay Evans kind of sort of got started. Now, they weren't that year, but uh, yeah. It's not, it's not Main Street. Yeah. 315 Main Street? Yeah. Yeah. Good thought. Yeah. Oh, just, I'm still a business there. Yes, yes, there is. I was thinking of a plaque, I think it's in Milwaukee, where the American League was, they had big meetings, which basically found, got the American League stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think it's in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things Mike Vance suggested was I thought it was kind of interesting if we go off the Colt Stadium, for example. Uh, I guess that property is owned by Harris County. Uh, it's a parking lot right now. And maybe uh, now I've got plaque. Withdraw the diamond on the driveway on the parking lot. Say, here's home plate, here's first base, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They've done that, and Milwaukee's done that, the Rays have done that, the Yankees have done that at their ballparks. And that's actually pretty similar to that. Yeah, yeah. In so, their parking. Yeah. And in Hot Springs, they have on the a home plate where Babe Ruth did yeah. that home run in the warehouser parking lot across from the alligator. <laughs> they can go stand there where Babe was. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's famous for it. Didn't That's he? classic. That's classic. That's classic. Five hundred seventy-three feet. His first game is right too. And Mike, didn't you say that uh, in Hot Springs that uh, we go with the markers? There's like this says like um, dial this phone number, or whatever, on your cell phone, and you get a narrative. Yeah, now I know how to work those little codes, or you can play the video on the channel. But yeah, they have spots all over Hot Springs like that. With why does it seem like a worthwhile project for us to uh, consider? Marker program? Yeah. We're going to spot something Mike said about Minimane. I don't know if you're thinking about inside or outside, but I for us visualizing if there's any space outside, we had, had some space, had like a, kind of like a map, I guess, of the greater Harris County and different stars on it, ballparks. And then Say, just go to that location and see the marker or whatever. Maybe even that's good. Um, yeah, that's good. You can have that audio also. Oh, we're looking yeah. just make it some stuff on the text and a number here. Boom. Well, to take it a step further, here's QR codes, augmented reality, and have things that pop up on the phone in front and they're looking at some art. Yeah, but I didn't kind of work one. Specifically for the film, but you can do that anywhere. 
did, they did a really great job for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 launch, where you could see the, at the stage of it and see the rocket west off right in front of us. That's it. Okay. We have some volunteers that want, would like to get involved with it. Got to have some people who are willing to do some legwork on this project. You also said something to do with uh, promoting scholarships. Yes, yes, that's fine. Well, I, we need to zero in on one project. I don't think we, okay, well, I don't think we, you know, if that's the one we want to pursue, that's fine. But I think we'll be lucky to get right. anything, uh, you know. Mike Vance said, let's try it for a thousand. I said, no, let's try it for two. It always turns down. Let's go for what we'll, it will take, because it'll take $2,000 minimum for a mark. In fact, he was telling me how they had to go to San Antonio to pick it. They couldn't afford the freight. They bring in one of the markers, so they had to go get it. What's the fun? Put it in the back of a pickup truck. I mean, that's what you do. That's what you do. So I hear some volunteers. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Sure. Okay. How many have any problems on talk to you? Well, I think, I think there's some uh, multimedia opportunities yeah. to uh, tie back to the YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's, there's uh, uh, whatever we can find. We're, we're talking about okay. now. We're not talking about, you know, actually yeah. facilitating yeah. anything. Yeah. We want to get them to agree to our project. Uh, and with, so there's an outline, there's an outline for that project. And I'll send it to you. Okay, so we did a book. We researched the book with all the ballparks in mm -hmm. So, and we did two plaques, the Astrodome and the West End. So, what ballparks did we miss that were located or zeroing in on old 45 Stadium? And put it's just two that don't three section of that. Just two that have plaque. Well, we got Buff Stadium. Yeah, Buff Stadium's got it. Yeah, Buff Stadium. Toll Stadium, uh, East End Park, um, the old racetrack. Um, well, I need to play ba baseball inside a racetrack here in town over near Rice. There are, yeah, there are a number of facilities. Uh, we only can pick one. And we got to get the property owner's permission. So it's not something you can say, hey, we're going to do this. We got to go through all the steps. And uh, my parents were telling me all the steps they had to go through the two year process. Just doesn't happen all the time. But we can make a submission about here's what we plan to do. This is the setup, setup, et cetera. This is what's going to cost. Here's how we visualize it. Come on. Good. So we Thank have you. to narrow down to a ballpark. And yeah. Proceed from there. I would think that would be the proper approach. Well, it seems like the, the hang up is the property owner and the money. And yeah. if you get the money taken care of, yes. then just then just whichever property owner wants that plaque yeah. will get it. And it's one of the things about uh, Colt Stadium is an RG, an RG Stadium's property, and it'd probably be easier to get. Jack Moore, it'd be easier to get the property owner and say yes. We need some help. I know uh, executive director, which one is sports and convention corporation. He's a friend of mine, and we can, yeah. we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that's what's, what's going to take, Mike. Yeah, exactly. I'm negative to them. I don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> He's well, a busy man, but uh, yeah, so you got Mike Acosta on a project, he's on a project. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have a lot of time, but he'll, he'll get on really. Okay. If he does, uh, go model for him. Okay. Yeah. Real quick, Mike, we need to talk about the newsletter. We have a newsletter that's due to be out next week. It's not going to come out next week because we're going to wait until the World Series is over. But Tony, you want to bring us up to date on where we stand? And Scott? Thanks, Scott. Well, I think we have some articles uh, ready to go, and uh, I'll just say more articles. Somebody has some ideas to send articles. We uh, you can say something new, but about when it comes out uh, about the season, some retrospective there. That certainly is different. There's a project that we can do. Yeah, if anyone wants to write something up about the Astro season, that'd be a oh, great yeah. thing to have. And uh, we hopefully get some from the skeeters. Well, something about Eddie yeah. Robinson just passed away. He played in Baltimore <laughs> before he went to the major leagues. Yeah. So did Reggie Jackson. All the greats. Here's a here's a here's a thought. Oh, I, I was just listening to this radio debating what's the greatest Houston Astro team of all time. 
And the consensus was it was 2019 and they didn't win the World Series, but they were actually the greatest team that the Astros had, especially out this last five years. Yeah. And they had a point. Yeah. I mean, they won 107 games in regular season. Two aces. They had two aces. But they could. By the way, home field advantage, if, if it ever was shown not to be the fact that that was I, I, just bizarre. I, I'm serving you. And the uh, 1906 Chicago Cubs, they said the record that most games going to be lost in White Sox. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, it's actually it was the Seattle Mariners. And uh, anyway, things like that. So, well, oh, 116. Yeah. Seven. Mariners. If you know something, yeah. we'll go ask for like that. If someone can write something up, we need to get their agreement tonight. Yeah. But because it just doesn't happen. Just because you ask for somebody to write something up, it doesn't happen. So if, if, if somebody wants to delve into that after the little series is over, uh, that would be I great. Mean, We've also got our coming up on George. No way. We do have him in the what's that? The Joe West article you wrote oh, yeah. will be in the next. It'll come out in November, early November. Why even just the talk shows? Why that yeah. great Joe West? Yeah. Why that for his retirement? Speaking of Joe West, I get tired of hearing all these talk show people put him in class with Angel Hernandez and Laz Diaz. Joe is a really good ball strike guy. He also knows the rules. No, he doesn't bloom around very well anymore. But I, I always used to bug because I watched the last game I saw him watch. I was a playoff. Yeah. He was on that strike zone. Well, yeah, the, the wild card game? Yeah, he was on he that strike zone. Any, he didn't miss one. You see these guys missed pitches by eight inches. <laughs> and 23 pitches here. Uh, yeah, 23 pitches in one game by Diaz. Interesting. I think now today, it's right now to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to have... Let's, they're going to have three umpires who've never umpired a World Series game before. Um, good or bad, I don't know. We'll see. Fred well, they've, been, guy. they've been in there seven, nine years. So. Yeah, well, we had some in there 20 years that couldn't call balls. Right? Look at, they're not so bad. We had one center. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Bob, those younger kids might have better rounds. Maybe so. Maybe so, Fred. Maybe, maybe that's what we need. We'll find out. Conroy, who's a uh, home plate tomorrow, he's uh, from Houston. Is he really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll have to invite him in here. He'll take some rocks. Are we cheating again? If we need to. <laughs> Believe me, it'll come up. Okay, let's, let's go to our uh, infamous trivia contest. Fred, you're up, partner. Will they do Zoom? We're going to do it too. Sure. Okay, so uh, we have to read it. Yeah, read them. Yeah. Well, you're smiling at anybody. Why? I always let my brother just say, yeah, you're doing some science. That's pretty science. I'll ask you. You're smiling. 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 you Okay. 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 Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, so all right. All right. I'm going to give you a spell. Where did that quit? Are we doing a team? Yes. You need a team? Okay. Okay. Good to see you. I will tell you that the guy who wrote the guy who wrote it uh, had been with me. Yeah. With me. Yeah. What is his name? Chris Phillips. Chris Phillips? Yeah. And he's from where? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. They all think um, Carnegie's University. Yeah. And he did the book about four. Here in Boring. We are. Two Google Hangs out. I'll block the screen. Three. I'll turn the camera and get to you. Okay. Maybe December, though. Shake these. You guys ready for a trivia quiz? Scorching. <laughs> so, so, Shelly. Dan's got it. Mr. Shelly. Okay, are we ready? I did one. Yeah. I just got it. I've always been so. Yeah. Oh, it's an old thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 you can get to look at the guy away from the boss. Yeah. Okay, ready? Number one. 
Who was on deck when Bill Nazaroski hit his World Series walk-up homer? Who's on deck? Number two. Name the pitcher who has a record for the longest complete game in World Series history. 14 innings. And a hint, he was a lefty. Did you get it? Did you know him? <laughs> Number three, who pitched the last complete game in a World Series? Hint, Royals. When people talk about the records that will never be broken, I think 749 complete games by Cy Young. Uh, that's more than the 511 wins. 749 complete games. Number four, who was the only pitcher to appear in all seven games of one World Series? And Oakland A's. Your brother got that. Number five, what World Series winner was outscored by 20 runs by opponents during the regular season? That's a basic stat. Could you repeat that question? I didn't hear it. What World Series winner? was outscored by 20 runs by opponents during the regular season. They had a minus 20. Number six, who holds the World Series batting record for a World Series? It came during a four game sweep and he batted 750. And there's another hint I can give you. Before he set the record, he was a Houston Astro. Well, Hank Bell. The Hank Bauer played football for the Chargers. Seven fifty. In the 2005 World Series, the Astros lost four straight to the White Sox. How many runs did the White Sox outscore the Astros in those four games? You know, it has to be a minimum of four. Fire is crazy. Number eight, what Astros pitcher lost two games in the 2005 World Series? They lost four straight, so he lost two of them. 50%. <laughs> Number nine, who was on deck for Toronto when Joe Carter hit his walk-off homer? Homer. Who would have gotten the chance when Bobby Thompson had his big home run? Willie Mays was on that. Number 10. After Don Larson's perfect game, what World Series hurler came the closest to pitching a no hitter in the World Series? And it was a one hitter. And I remember watching it. I'll see what was when I was a kid. I'll give you another hint. Or from like 1910. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, what is the only team to have won and lost the World Series in three different cities? They won in three cities and they lost in three cities. Oops.
it's probably the easiest one out here, but it's, it's still a couple of choices. Number 12, who is the one World Series MVP chosen from the losing team? Not from the winner. Mark, who's your question? <laughs> Number 13, what team has won two World Series titles as a wild card team, but has never won their own division? That's crazy. The only way to get in the series is to be wild card. Number 14. What two teams played the first night game in World Series history? That must surprise me. <laughs> Because I know the first night game in baseball was 39, but it took a while for the yeah. World Series. Surprised. Now, number four. Huh? Uh, I said they were still playing all day World Series games. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'll give you that hint, too. It was in the 50s. It was after the 50s. Okay, 15. What World Series is the only time the road team won every game in the series? <laughs> I think everybody will get that. <laughs> yeah, it's rarely talking about. Now, this year, I think uh, Albert Pujols, going to be a Hall of Famer, played for the Dodgers. Now, 10, 15 years from now, is anybody going to remember that? They're going to remember the angels, the Cardinals and the Angels. But will they remember he played for the Dodgers? So what we got in the next uh, 10 questions is uh, what team did these Hall of Famers end up with? Their last, when they were on the roster last. Number 15, 16 is Juan Marichal. What team did he retire from? There's a couple in here I, I, I didn't get, so it's, that's why it's tough. Number 17, Wade Boggs. Who did he end his career with? Number 18, Gary Carter. What team did Gary end up with? Number 19, Steve Carlton. Pack up. Huh? Not pack up. <laughs> Number 20, Dennis Eckersley. Do you remember where he ended up? It's 21. That's a good one, I thought. Goose Gossage. Who did he play for it last year? Number 22, Ferguson Jenkins. Number 23, this is a tough one too. What team did Vladimir Guerrero end his career with? Number 24, my brother got us right. Randy Johnson, who was his last team? People remember him like people that remember two holes, I don't know. And the uh, last regular question is Phil Negro. And then I have one bonus question here. 
when Joe West was installed as a regular major league umpire back in the 1978 season, who was the announcer for the Texas Rangers on TV? The hint, he's still announcing today. Not so much on TV, but he's announcing, you know, I know, no radio. Radio. Good job, good job. Now let's see if we can and let's see if anybody get them. Three or four. Yeah. Number one, who was on deck when Bill Mazeroski hit his World Series walk off homer? Oh, man. No. Nick Rowe. Huh? Nick Rowe. No. Al Smith? Huh? Al Smith. Don Hoke. Who? Don Hoke. No. No. Bill Here's Burden. the thing. Bill Burden. Who was, no. Who was the first baseman that got duped out of uh, when Mickey Mantle got picked off and then he got to get back? Who was the first baseman that missed him? No. Very long. It was Rocky Nelson was playing. So that gives you who was, who was on deck. No, Rocky was playing. Who was their regular first baseman that wasn't playing? Dick Stewart. Dick Stewart was on deck. I, was it? That was the guy who tried to steal home. He was thrown out. That's what he called Rocky. Right. Yep. Well, Name the pitcher who has the records for the longest complete game in World Series history. 14 innings. Pitch for Detroit. Huh? Right, 45. Mm -hmm. Who? Oh, you're Johnson. thinking of uh, Hal Newhauser? Newhauser? No. Warren okay, Spawn. No. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. That's good. Where was he born? <laughs> it was funny when we were talking. Hey, tell me something you don't about five <laughs> Just give it a few minutes. You win that game? Yes. Well, it's What's it over there? Okay, who pitched the last complete game in a World Series? And I said the Hint Royals. Nope. This year. Good. I think it was 85. 15. Twenty fifteen. He's still pitching today, right? But on a different team. Right. Right. Wade nope. Davis. Nope. Scream it out! Come on, Johnny Cueto. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the only pitcher to appear in all seven games of a World Series? Bobby Fingers. Nope. Okay. I knew everybody took the ball. Oh, Daryl Bowles. Daryl Knowles. Good. Wow. Good. Wow. It's so tired, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, the World Series winner was outscored by 20 runs by opponents during the regular season. Matt. No. Mark Harris. Mark Who? Who? 59 White Sox. Nope. 60 bars. It's in the 80s. 87 twins. Yes. Wow. Yes. Look at that. John got that. Yeah. 80, 87 twins. That's right. Good job. Um, who holds the World Series battle record for a World Series? He had 750. Billy Hatcher. Billy Hatcher. Billy Hatcher. Yep. Ex Astro, too. Who was it? Reds, Cincinnati Reds, 1990. Well, I had Gary Swing. Gary got a quick injury. Yeah. That's not Hatcher. What's that? Gary. No. Billy Hatcher, seven, that it's 750. In 2005, World Series, the Astros lost four straight to the White Sox. How many runs did the White Sox outscored the Astros by? Six. We're still trying. <laughs> two runs, one run, two runs, one run. Last game, one nothing. So who is the 
Astro pitcher who lost two of them. Uh, Oswald. Brad Lidge. I tell you. Brad Lidge. I'm sorry, I'm late. Yeah. Number nine, who was on deck for Toronto when Joe Carter hit his lock up home? Jose. No. George Springer. No. Tony Fluche, I know. Huh? The Mahler? Who? Paul Mahler? No. Gary Clark? George Bell. No, but he used to wear a bat helmet even in the field. Rude. John Olerud. Oh, yeah. Okay. John Olerud was next. After Don Larson's perfect game, what World Series hurler came the closest to pitching a no-hitter? Jim Lonborg is right. Yeah. Then against the Cardinals. Against the Cardinals. Very good. I got one right on the expedition. You got my guess. When's the only team to have won and lost the World Series in three different cities? No. Cardinals. Raves. Anything in Kentucky? Even win a World Series in Kansas. Raves. Austin, Milwaukee. Austin, Milwaukee, Atlanta. Who is the one World Series MVP chosen from the losing team? Bobby uh, Richardson. Richardson. I think 60. 60, yeah. When, uh, Could have lost it without it. Yeah, when Mazeroski hit his own. I don't understand why they make it most of it. Don't remind me. So that means the MVP was the other second baseman that didn't hit the winning. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Uh, what two... What team won two World Series titles as a wild card team but never won their own division? Marlins. 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 What two teams played the first night game in World Series history? Baltimore and Western. 1971. Huh? Yes. That's what I read that article about. I was reading about the, the oh, yeah. first night, game three or something. Baltimore, like. Pittsburgh, 71. Good. What World Series is the only time the road team played a regainable series? One we'll never speak of. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yep. That's crazy. Huh? Okay, now we'll do the uh, see if you guys remember where these guys were when they finished the careers. What team did Juan Marshall end up with? Awesome. Dodgers. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, Arch, right? Yes. After, after hitting Roseburg. Yeah. Roseburg is personal catcher there. Yeah. Okay, how about Wade Boggs? Tampa. Gary Carter. San Francisco. Yes. Nope. Man, Norfolk. Yes. Nope. Montreal. Nope. Atlanta. Nope. Dodgers. They all went to the Dodgers. They went to the Dodgers. <laughs> Here's the one I didn't I didn't know. Steve Carl, Minnesota. 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 I don't, I'm not at all playing for Minnesota. It's terrible. It was the twins, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Number 20, Dennis Eckersley. Nope. Boston. Nope. Cubs. St. Louis. How about Goose Gossett? Where's the yeah. No. Taxes. Huh? Majors. No. White Sox. Nope. Seattle. Huh? Seattle. Seattle. Seattle was right. No, it's coming. Good for him. Ferguson Jenkins. Cubs. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nope. No. Thanks. No. 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 Yes, Red Sox. Good one. Now here's one I think. Vladimir Guerrero. Where did he end? Yeah. How do you I didn't know that? Where was it? I couldn't hear it. Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah. Randy Johnson. No. No. West Coast. Oh, we went to San Francisco. San Francisco. At least you can. 
Uh, Phil Negro. Yeah, he's Jack. No. Please. No. <laughs> you were talking about that team a minute ago. Oh, Toronto? Oh. Toronto Blue Jays, Phil Negro. Wow. Does the book of all work that time? I'm glad you back, right? Yes. <laughs> I told you this is what I like, like K-Line and Mute. Yeah. Four years. Okay, so here's the bonus one. When Joe West was installed as a regular major league umpire in the 78 season, who was the announcer for the Texas Rangers on TV? Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. No. They were still playing. Miller? John Miller. John Miller. Not too many people remember him with the Texas Rangers. No. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta say, you were yeah. wrong. Uh, who, who got the most? Who has two? <laughs> there's, an incorrect, there's an incorrect answer there. Uh, Brittany Jenkins was 40 years old when he ended his career with the Cubs in 83. I mean, uh, I my God, I had six. I, got a I had okay. seven. Hey, Mike got eight points. He's wonderful. I thought we could have blocked it. That was really awesome. It took me a few days. I did it. I just kept digging and digging. And then when I saw the new cool holes going, I figured out. I just looked at a couple of those guys and I go, oh, that's oh, that's that was that was amazing. Well, this was number three, right? Don't you? <laughs> yeah, Fergie Jenkins and the with the Cubs, <laughs> 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 three. Does it matter, Fergie? You got the bonus, for Miller. Us. Yeah, Fergie Jenkins and with the Cubs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Fergie Fergie. three. Red Sox. That's the Cubs on the Yeah. Then I messed that one up. It's Cubs, eighty-three. I just looked left. After the Red Sox. Yes, yeah. he was a Texas after Washington. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, there is. So what's the answer? Correct. I'm it. Oh, we got double figure and beat my brother. So that's all I care about. I didn't know that. Here's for Texas. <laughs> I princess. He won up with an announcement. Oh, he did. Yes, I'm fine. Well, then they flipped it up wrong somehow. Okay, so. All right. still going to change. Okay. Thank you. Very nice. Everybody still talking about the trivia contest. Okay. Good. We will call a meeting. We will have a meeting of our new subcommittees on uh, markers. Hopefully in a couple of weeks. Uh, find a date when uh, everybody is available to visit for a, few, for a hour or so. Maybe here. Uh, we're also going to have a board meeting okay. in, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm not sure when. The, well, we know when the next meeting is. It'll be the third Monday in November, we're still working on speakers a little bit. We don't have anybody tied down at this minute. Don't know we don't know who. Right. But we don't know. Thank you. Now, let's go back there. Uh, Marsha, we got 28 people. Really get somebody. Guys, yeah. 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 Not a bad number, considering we're not on our regular. Any other comments? I would suggest get somebody from the World Champion Astros for November. Oh, yes. We just show highlights the whole meeting. I have a suspect. We can count all the pitches that got missed on the play. Our front blow prisoner in meeting. It's cold in here. That's cold. Uh, hey, Marsha, to be fair, I did not count our three. Yes, over here. I did not count. <laughs> That's the says. <laughs> and don't forget. Folks in the back of the room from uh, Rachel and Fred. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.